As we're looking at tonight the criteria, we have been looking at the judgment seat of Christ, and we started out looking at what the Bema seat, the judgment seat is, and then last week we dealt with the evaluation that takes place there, and tonight our focus, the last in the series that we're looking at on the judgment seat itself, is the criteria. Uh, Woodrow Kroll uh, wrote a book on the study of the Christian's heavenly rewards called Tested by Fire uh, many years ago, and he wrote the following. As a student for many years and later as a college professor, I noticed much interest in a system of justice known as grading on the curve. I know I had one professor at Otterbein that truly graded on the curve, and I, I hated that. <laughs> Because out of the students, there were so many that were going to get A's and, and, and the other end of that curve. And, and then the, just you think about that bill curve. And, and I, the, I didn't like the idea of the grading on the curve. Because you're, you're kind of put up against the other students and how they're doing. And how they did on that exam is the whole basis of it. And so when you think about... That the, not much interest in that system of justice, knowing that the curve system allows the mean grade to fluctuate with the scholastic ability of the class. By doing so, it is assumed a grading system becomes more closely aligned with the achievement of those involved. But as any teacher, and especially any student, will tell you, such a system has its faults. It tends to pit one student against another in grade competition instead of pitting all students against a standard of excellence. Then again, all a lazy student must do to secure a passing grade is convince each other member of his class to do equally as poorly on an exam. The teacher will then be obliged to curve all the grades upward. Granted, not many students are so gullible as to allow the class dunce to appear on a par with the rest of the class, but this has been known to happen. God does not grade on the curve. With respect to salvation, God does not say, I know you're all failures, but the top third of the failures will be able to enter heaven. Not at all. God grades against the standard of excellence. He explicitly indicates, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. God's criterion is Christ. When we are compared with the perfect life of God, the Son, we just don't measure up. God doesn't overlook that. He, doesn't, uh, he does something about it. He makes us measure up by imputing to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We who have fallen short of the minimum requirement for acceptance into heaven have been made fit for entrance by receiving Jesus Christ as Savior. Just as God has a criterion for accepting us in regard to salvation, likewise He has certain criteria for accepting us in regard to service. As has already been noted, not all that we do in Jesus' name will be accepted by Him as legitimate service. Only that which proves authentic through the fiery test, only that which measures up to the criteria will be regarded as acceptable. The natural question is, what is the criteria by which our life of service will be judged? What is Christ the judge looking for? Answers may vary widely, but let me suggest the most obvious. In judging our life of service to Him, Jesus Christ will be concerned with the criteria of source, faithfulness, proportion, and motive. So when we think about the criteria with the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to look at primarily two passages tonight. The first one is Galatians 2.20. And this could be called the Christ in you principle. When we think about the criteria of our standing before the Lord Jesus Christ to be recompensed, rewarded for what has been done in the body. What is the criteria, the focus of that evaluation that the Lord Jesus is rewarding to serve us? And the criteria, when we think about Galatians 2.20, what Paul writes here. Paul starts out, I have been crucified with Christ, identified with Jesus in his death. We see this picture with believer's baptism. Romans 6, the idea that I am 
pictured, I'm identified with Jesus in his death. That is when the, the believer is standing and, and that's the identification with Jesus in his death. And then identification down in the water, what's that identification with? Burial, Jesus in his burial. And then out of the water, back up, identified with his resurrection. And Romans says to walk in newness of life, a new quality of life. It's saying I am under new management, no longer under Adam, but now under the headship of Jesus Christ. I'm identified with him. And that's the, the wonderful truth. And so Galatians 2.20, as Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live. So the first point, I have been crucified with Christ, my identification. Kenneth Wiest in his word studies in the Greek New Testament wrote the following. That verb is in the perfect tense which speaks of a past completed action having present finished results. Paul uses it to show that his identification with Christ at the cross was a past fact and that the spiritual benefits that have come to him through his identification are present realities with him. It's not I am being crucified, I have been crucified. I am identified with Jesus Christ, with his death, and ultimately with his burial and resurrection, to walk in newness, a new quality of life. Charles Ryrie in the study Bible notes that crucifixion with Christ means death to or separation from the reigning power of the old sinful life and freedom to experience the power of the resurrection life of Christ by faith. So when Paul boldly declares, I have been crucified with Christ, it is therefore no longer I who live. It is not the reigning power of that old sin nature. No more. It's not the reigning power of that sin nature. So when you think about this as a believer, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, do we have to sin as believers? No, we're not under the ruling power, the reigning power of sin. We still choose to disobey the Lord and yield to temptation, and that is sin. And so we are guilty of that as believers. We know that from 1 John 1, 9. We know that from 1 John chapter 2. The very reality that John says, these things are written that you may not sin. But if you sin, you have a, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The very fact. There are some groups that, uh, not as much today as they used to, uh, many years in history, many more on the holiness end, that, that would teach that you could reach this point of sinless perfection here on this earth. But that doesn't line up with the teaching of Scripture. Because the Bible says we're having this battle, Galatians 5, the flesh against the spirit, and, and until we get to be with the Lord. And there's the reality that we are guilty of sin. But the reigning power of sin no longer has its hold over us because of the work of Christ and our identification with Jesus. So we can experience the power of the resurrection life of Christ by faith. So Paul continues on in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is therefore no longer I who live, but now Christ lives where? In me. But Christ lives in me. But Christ lives in me. The expositor C.I. Schofield, you may have heard that name, and he's known it but the Schofield Reference Bible. And C.I. Schofield presented a basic truth. Christianity is the outliving of an indwelling Christ. The outliving of an indwelling Christ. The very biblical truth that Paul says, it's no longer I that live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Now what's this have to do with the judgment seat of Christ? We're going to see that very truth. So anything that is accomplished, 
that's going to be rewarded is mean that we are doing a cooperation with the Holy Spirit who is exalting Christ in us. That will be what is rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Point number two on your outline under B, instead of attempting to live his life in obedience to a set of rules in the form of the legal enactments of the Mosaic law, Paul now yields to the indwelling Holy Spirit and cooperates with him in the production of a life pleasing to God, energized by the divine life resident in him through the work of the Spirit. When I'm trying to do things in my own strength in accordance to a list of rules, you know what that, that is? That's legalism. That is legalism. Can believers that have truly been saved by God's grace through faith, can they be guilty of trying to grow in Christ through legalism? Yeah. If uh, the focus is on a bunch of externals, you cannot gauge spiritual growth by saying, oh, I can just check off a bunch of things and say I'm growing in Christ. Here's the reality. A person can read through the Bible in a year. A person can, can have prayer times and, and be you know, praying and they can even you know, be uh, faithfully going to church and, and different things. And doing these various things, they're, they're great, but what happens is, if they're not getting into that deeper fellowship with the Lord, of recognizing it's Jesus Christ in me. Paul, or, and then we have Jesus saying in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you're the branch, but apart from me, you can do Is it possible to have service that is well-intentioned but apart from the power of the Holy Spirit where it would be done by the flesh or my own ability? You know, so oftentimes God calls us to do things that are outside of our realm of being comfortable. Amen. Amen. And a lot of times our reaction may be like Moses. Oh, there has to be mistakes. I've never been an eloquent speaker, Lord. You want me to go to Pharaoh and talk to him? I can't do that. I'm slow of tongue. I'm not able. In Exodus 4, we see the Lord was really angered by this. Because the Lord even says, Who's made the mouth? And even who has made the lame or the blind? Have not I? When we say, I don't feel qualified, that's exactly where the Lord wants us. Because when we don't feel qualified, and we say, I'm not able to do this, this is beyond my strength, this is beyond my ability, exactly. I have to trust you, Lord. And if I am never doing anything that the Lord has called me, and he's called me and he's stretching me and calling me beyond my comfort zone, and then I just sit back and say, I'm just doing the things that I have the ability to do. But it could be apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. And it could be just based upon your personal, uh, the strengths that you have, that you've been born with. And Jesus said, Apart from me, you can do nothing of spiritual value. So the Christ living in me, the Christ in you principle, is the very reality of the truth of the Christ lives in me is the source of acceptable service. It's because Jesus at work in me and the Holy Spirit empowering me to be obedient to what God has called me to do. Woodrow Cole wrote in the following, in our lives, that which is acceptable to God is done by Jesus Christ. What did Paul say? I am what I am by the grace of God. 
It was God's grace at work. It was the power of the Holy Spirit in me. That which is acceptable to God is done by Jesus Christ who dwells in us. In our lives, that which is acceptable to God brings glory to Him through Christ and also brings reward to us from Jesus Christ. So the focus will be what we have allowed as God is doing through us and as in cooperation being that vessel available to Him, allowing Him to use us. And that is the rewarded aspect. When we think about the criteria, the Christ in you principle. The rest of that verse, Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So I am living by faith in the Christ who died and gave himself up for me. So that which is done by faith, by taking God at his word, by trusting him, allowing the Holy Spirit to empower me. Does this make sense as we're going through and we see the Christ in you principle, the very aspect, and when we think about the Bema seat and standing before the Lord Jesus Christ and being rewarded, recompensed for what has been done in the body. It's really on the basis of what I've allowed the Holy Spirit to be doing through me, empowering me. And it's not something that I've accomplished in my own strength, in my own ability. Those things that are based upon my own strength and my own abilities will be burned up. The wood, hay, and the straw on that day. It's not lasting. It's not lasting. If it's not been based upon the work of the Holy Spirit as he was working through me in the presence of the Lord, that the Lord be glorified there. And by grace, by trusting him, by faith in living our life in the Lord Jesus. The next passage I want you to see is 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 1 to 5, what the Bible says. The second point is faithfulness. When we think about criteria, it's faithfulness. The Bible says faithful stewards, in verses 1 and 2, what Paul writes, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ. First, a, a quick note on that word servants. It's not the word diakonos that we often think of here. It's not talking about that word. It's a word Paul uses that literally means an under rower. It was the picture of the slaves on the ancient ships that were in the lower part that were using the oars. And, and as they are in that lower, they're, they're the, the galley slaves. That's the word that he is using. The Apostle Paul says, let a man regard us in this manner. We are the slaves, the under rowers of Christ. So the Apostle Paul said, the believers in Corinth, they were guilty of trying to elevate, whether it be Paul or trying to elevate Apollos. You know, they were, they were divided. They, they had different factions and they said, I'm a Paul, and I'm, a, I'm of Apollos. And this one section said, Paul, oh, we're a Christ. And Paul said, is Christ divided? When you were baptized, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Were you baptized in the name of Apollos? No, you were baptized in the Lord. And he would go on and he's talking here, dealing with this division, but he's, he's saying, you're getting all caught up of wanting to follow these mere men. He said, I planted Apollos water, but who gave the increase? God. It always gets me, sometimes you'll hear 
I've been to conferences, been to, you know, heard tremendous preachers and teachers, but sometimes in the introductions, They'll say, so-and-so has grown this church to this many people. And here's the reality. If that's a Bible-based church, that man did not grow that church. But how many times, have you ever opened up a Christian book and read that in the Bible? I have. So and so has grown every church he's ever been in to so many thousands of people. Here's the thing it's not just semantics. They're not careful, they're attributing the man, but only the God's to the Lord. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God. Gave the increase. God gave the increase. God was at work. Now that pastor may be faithful and devoted to the Lord and faithfully serving the Lord, yes. But being available to use to allow God to be working. But it's God who is doing the work. It's God who is saving souls. It is God who is growing the believers. It is God, and we can rejoice in that. But we must not attribute that to man. And the Apostle Paul says, believers, you're talking about Paul, you're talking about Apollos, you're talking about the different men. Let a man regard us in this manner. We are under rowers of Christ. We're the galley slaves. We are those, the slaves that rode in the lower bank of oars on a large ancient ship. That's what we are. We're servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The word for steward means house law. A steward was an administrator, a trustee, an overseer of an estate. He was under the owner within the house. Remember that description of Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis? Around uh, Genesis 37, when Joseph was sold by his brothers, and ends up, and, and Potiphar, a high official in Egypt, purchases him, and he makes him, and he sees that the Lord is blessing Joseph, and the Lord is with him, the Bible says, and he was the steward of Potiphar's house. That meant he was in control of everything, all the finances of everything for Potiphar. He was the steward. Joseph didn't own that, but he was handling it. He was the manager handling the awesome responsibility of everything that, that was Potiphar's. He was a faithful steward to that. And, and we have been called as stewards. God has given us, and we are accountable to the Lord as stewards of time. You know, we can't barter time like we can money. Wouldn't you like to have, when you hear somebody say, oh, I'm just killing time, or I'm just trying to make time go faster, you'd like to say, hey, can I have some of that time that you're not using? I can use it. We can't do that. We're all given the same number of minutes, the same second, number of seconds, and the same number of hours. Tomorrow when we wake up, we're going to be given, whoops, we're going to be given the same time, the same amount of time, and we are accountable for what we do with it. We are accountable as stewards. The Lord has provided financially for us. We're accountable with the finances. We are accountable with the relationships that God has given us. He has put you in the neighborhood where you live for a purpose. 
You have the relatives that you have for a purpose. The friendships that you have. The ability of influencing others spiritually. Those, that's a stewardship. Because God has given us that. So when we think about our lives and the stewardship of what God has given us, and Paul says we're stewards of the mysteries of God. In verse 2, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy or faithful. Potiphar could trust Joseph. He could trust him, couldn't he? And when we think about Joseph and, and Potiphar trusting Joseph, and the reality is that we are going to give an account. The steward will always give an account to the owner. And that steward must be found faithful or trustworthy. So when we think about criteria with the judgment seat of Christ, we think about what Paul wrote here, that one must be found trustworthy or faithful. We're also, have you ever seen your spiritual gift or plural spiritual gifts? There's difference between spiritual gifts and talents. An unsaved man or woman can be a tremendous singer. And, and somebody could hear somebody sing that doesn't know the Lord and say, they are very talented. That's not a spiritual gift. There's a difference between talents. Now, I believe that we also, that the Lord has given us talents, and we can use those talents in the service to the Lord. And it's a blessing. I'm not a talented singer, but I love to hear the, the, uh, Bruce and we have others that do a great job singing and, and leading and the, the singing and, and the and the choir, and as they were practicing, and as the choir sing, there's talents that the Lord has given, and they are using that for the Lord. But there's a difference than the spiritual gifts. I want you to see in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, the stewardship of the spiritual gifts the Lord has given us. We're told in 1 Corinthians 12, the Holy Spirit distributes gifts as He wills. He distributes as He wills. But in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning verse 10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the manifold grace of God, the Holy Spirit has given gifts that we are stewards and using those gifts to benefit one another. When the church comes together, the body of Christ, God's design is for the individual believers to be using their, their uh, spiritual gifts to the encouragement, the edification of the whole body. And when that is taking place, the Lord is glorified in that. It is something. And, you know, we've talked before about in the 80s and 90s, it was very popular these spiritual gift inventories. I never did well with them. I would have completely different answers for every time. <laughs> I, 
I really do. I think we made it make it harder than it really is. On the spiritual gift. You know that it's where are you passionate concerning serving? We have passions. I'm passionate about preaching and teaching. I love preaching and teaching. I pray all the time, Lord, would you give me more and more opportunities? Would you give me more and more opportunities to preach and teach your word? And he does. What are you passionate about? If you say, you know, I would do this, but I kind of do it out of drudgery. It, it, it just isn't my love. You know, there's times where you just say, okay, Lord, I want to serve you. Directly. So, there's people that say, you know, and we have dear folks here that are quick to send a card. Somebody is hurting and they want to get a card out to them. And there's a joy that they have in sending that card, sending that note of encouragement, sending that, that note, that letter out that just says, or, or the call that says, you were heavy upon my heart. I just wanted to check to see how you're doing. There's some great administrators, those that are organized and that do really well of, of being able to, to take it, something by the horns and just to lead in that area. You know, it's interesting because Peter here breaks it down to two categories, speaking gifts and serving gifts. And those that are in the speaking gifts are not more important than those in the serving gifts. But faithfully serving where the Lord is leading. But it's the availability. When we are available to say, Lord, would you just use me? I want to serve right where you want me to be. And he will direct. And he gives you a passion, a love for serving a certain area. I remember years ago when I was pastoring my first church and I had this wonderful man that came and he said he was teaching uh, middle, eight, middle school age boys, sixth through eighth grade boys. And he said, he came to me and he says, Pastor, he said, I, I wanted to do this. We needed somebody for this position and I'm giving it my all. But he said, I am boring those boys stiff. He said, they... I'm trying, I'm teaching, but they are not, this isn't where I'm supposed to be serving. And the man was a tremendous administrator. And he became leader of the whole Sunday school ministry. And he said, you know, I, I was trying to teach, but he says, that's not, I'm not gifted in this area. But I gave him credit. He did this for a matter of weeks, and he just said, I'm studying, I'm doing this, but... And then we saw somebody who was growing in the Lord and said, you know what? I believe the Lord wants me to do this. And he started teaching those boys. And this guy started administrating over the Sunday school ministry and seeing some great things happen. And I just was seeing as God, as people were serving in the areas that the Lord was stirring their hearts and, and that there was that desire. There's a stewardship here. Serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Faithfulness involves doing all that the master has commanded. Dr. Robert Gromacki wrote this following. Faithfulness involves doing all that the master has commanded, doing it according to the master's method, 
and doing it in the assigned time. There are constantly books out and conferences all the time on new methods. So you got to do this and, and this and this. You know what is so true is the Lord has already given us the method to do it according to his plan. According to what he said. And according to his time. I was thinking about this verse in Acts 13. I love this verse of a description about David. In Acts 13, 36. Notice what the Bible says here. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he served in his own time that God had him to serve, in his own generation. David served the purpose of God in his own generation at that time. He fell asleep, he died, and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But the point was, he served God, he served the purpose of God in the very time frame that he was given. And when he was done serving God, he died. When he had completed the purpose of God in his life, in that time frame, he died. But he served his own generation. That's a stewardship, isn't it? Accountability as faithful to God in the stewardship. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 5, and we're going to see more about the judgment, Christ's judgment. Paul writes, But to me it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you. There were, uh, there were some in the church there in Corinth that were very critical of the Apostle Paul. They were very critical of him. And Paul was saying, I just counted a very small thing, to be honest with you, he said that I may be examined by you. That's not arrogance. But he was just saying reality is, I'm not losing sleep over it. Or by any human court. In fact, I don't even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. In verse 5, therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. But wait until the Lord comes, who will bring, both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness, and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. He's describing the Bema seat. So Christ's judgment... Jesus will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness. Dr. Grabacki notes, this probably refers to deeds when a person is alone, totally unsupervised, or watched by men. Men didn't see it, but God did. I love that verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It's amazing, it's in the resurrection chapter. That Paul finishes that chapter by saying, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Even when men doesn't see it, nobody else is seeing it, I notice. The Lord says, I take note. Jesus will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness. And he will disclose the motives of men's hearts. He says there in verse 5, disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. We were talking about this earlier when Paul was rejoicing that the, the word of God is preached. That even when there were those that were preaching from envy or strife, 
or selfish ambition. Paul was just like, I am just so thankful and I'm rejoicing in the Lord that the gospel is going forth, that the gospel message is being preached. And, and he says, you know, the ambition of the men that are preaching, that's not my focus. The Lord will take care of that. The Lord is the judge of, uh, in verse 5. He will disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. He will disclose that at the appropriate time. As we finish tonight, we'll just read one time, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, as the reminder of the judgment seat. 2 Corinthians 5.10, the Apostle Paul says, For me must all appear, literally it's we must all be revealed before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed, that means rewarded, for his deeds in the body. It's an evaluation. The criteria we focused on tonight. What has been done, it's the Christ in you principle. What we have done by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And being faithful to the Lord as a faithful steward. To be recompensed or rewarded for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Remember, we looked at that word bad and it meant, uh, you know, good for nothingness or the idea of not worthwhile was the, the idea behind that. So the criteria, the Christ in you principle in faithfulness, faithful stewards and servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. All to be found faithful, amen? The desire before the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you so much as we've seen tonight and as the Apostle Paul wrote very clearly and throughout the ministry made clear the focus wasn't on what he was doing but you were using him as a mighty vessel he said I planted Apollos watered but if there's any growth that was from God Lord, the judgment seat of Christ, and we saw from 1 Corinthians 3 that to be rewarding the deeds done in the body, it's not a pair of scales showing of the size, but fire to test what sort it is. Oh, to be a faithful steward Stewards of what you have given us. And giving an account. And to know that apart from that abiding, that fellowship abiding in you, apart from you, Lord, we can do nothing of spiritual value. And all that has been done in our own strength, our own abilities, our own focus word of, of, of what would be on our own strength that that would just be burned up because it can't be rewarded thank you Lord for all that you do and are continuing to do and we want to be those vessels for you to work through we thank you so much, as Paul wrote, that it's so true for us that we can realize and recognize I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
In the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.